We're going. We're going. Yay! Yeah! Hello, everyone. Welcome to this one. This one is a very chilled and cosy one. We have drinks. I have. We have pajamas on and massive slippers. I have tea. This should be quite relaxed. So, today's session, uh, we're going to be talking you through um, how a camera works in terms of the settings that it has and how to get the most out of your camera to use these settings. So essentially what we're trying to do is help you get out of just using auto mode because you get a lot more um, creative control of your pictures if you, yeah, if you can use the camera properly. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to talk about is just exposure in general. So, what you can see on the PowerPoint slide here is an absolutely amazing image that tells you everything. You don't need me to do this talk, all you need is this image. Um, so, what this does is it shows the relationship between aperture, ISO and shutter speed and how that works to give you the exposure of the photo. So, what is the exposure? It's essentially, um, well, visually it comes across as how bright the photo is and what it is is how much info there is in the photo. So a well exposed photo will have, well, when I say well, that's slightly objective, but anyway, um, a well exposed photo will have information for every part of the picture. So the dark areas, there will be info about the picture still in there and in the highlights there will still be information available for the camera to see there so if a camera if camera if a photo is overexposed if we look at the little square with our model cog in there so if we overexpose the image you can see there's the area down here in the bottom where it essentially doesn't have any more info because it's too bright. It's completely whited out because it just cannot read that much information. So this is like in film photography, if you expose the film for too long, then you get no more information, everything is like blitzed out. This then goes in the opposite direction if you, oh I'm going in the wrong direction underexpose the image. No, you're going in the right direction. I was going in the right direction. Yeah. You hit bold instead. I hit bold, that's bad. I was still doing that. If you go in the other direction and underexpose it, what you get is these dark areas that you can't even see my finger pointing to them. You get these dark areas where you also can't read any information from it because there's not enough light that the camera can like gather to try and find it. However, um, whilst it's good to try and go for a well exposed photo, it is your decision creatively whether or not you want to over or under expose your photo because sometimes, for example, you will want to under expose a photo, say if you're looking to get a silhouette in the photo where you don't need information from your subject, you just need the outline and the darkness. So there are times when going for a well exposed photo is not the right artistic choice but again because it's an artistic choice that is up to you next slide right i'm going in the wrong direction again i can never remember i've, I've lost my mouse you've lost the mouse oh i found the mouse you found the mouse well done losing mouse is generally yeah yeah here we go iso i decided to start with this one because this one is slightly separate to um, aperture and shutter speed in the sense that it, it doesn't affect the amount of light that you're gathering. In digital photography what it does is it takes the light that it can see and then amplifies it so it seems brighter. It takes the information it has and makes more of it to work out what should be there. So if you look at the little graphic on the screen you can see if you're working at a low ISO, um, which is a low sensitivity, most of the 
information is from the actual light that's coming in and then there's a tiny little bit of amplification which is just giving it a little bit more brightness, a little bit more sensitivity. And then if you look at the other side, at the high ISO, what it does is it takes your tiny amount of light coming in and it amplifies it so that you get the same level of exposure but it's more amplified rather than actual light that's being gathered. So um, what this does in terms of the photograph as well as just affecting the brightness and the exposure is this gives the image noise. So what noise is, is when you amplify the signal that you have, it has to kind of guess what colour the pixel should be, it has to guess what the area around the information it has should be. So what you can get is you can get random little patches of like multicoloured, um, slightly random coloured areas which give it this noise. And at the right amount this can give it a lovely like grain to the image, so it kind of throws back to film photography. Um, so if you want to go for that kind of look, then changing your ISO and increasing it gives you the nice amount of grain. But you've got to be careful because if you take it too far, then your photo just looks a bit dodgy. So I will give you an example here. So if we look here, I'm going to change the ISO all the way down to 100 and just mess about with the settings a little bit so we can take a photo. So we have Just a quick photo there, and I will take another one where I'm going to increase the ISO way up. So this is going to go all the way up to 6400. Wow, that's bright. So we'll then turn it this way. There is better. Way, there are better ways to do this, but oh well. Needs maths. Yeah, you can never make things easy. That's too easy. <laughs> Okay, and then we'll take a photo here. So then, once that is taken, it takes its time to load. We will press go. And we'll have a look at these two images side by side, so you can see the difference between a high and a low ISO. So, right there, we're back to whee! There. So, look at the image. So, this one has the incredibly high ISO. I've gone in the wrong direction again. So if you zoom in there, you can see there's like random patches of colour and that's the noise from the amplification. And if we zoom back out and go to the photo here, which has a really low ISO, you can see there's next to none of that there because it hasn't needed to amplify it. So ISO is really great to control when you want to give a photo just like a little bit of grain, a little bit of an ollie worldly feel. Um, and it's good for helping change your level of brightness when you can't adjust your aperture or your shutter speed. So the last thing to note about ISO is that doubling your ISO changes the amount of light coming in um, by doubling it as well. So you double the ISO, you double the amount of light coming in. And if you double the amount of light coming in, that's called increasing the amount of light by one stop. So remember that. We'll come back to this in the next bit. May I have the next slide, please? You may. We need to invest in one of those like clippers. We do. Although that will put you out of a job. I would. I, 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 need, I, need the, I need the tech man job. Tech man. Should speed. New. Oh, the car on the graph goes, I see a car, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay, so shutter speed, as I spoke about in the um, anatomy of a camera session, which is now on YouTube, like this is on YouTube, so you should go watch it after this. Um, so what this um, does is it controls the amount of time that your sensor is exposed for. So if you expose the sensor for a long amount of time, more light is gathered because it's got more time to gather it. And if you have a really quick shutter speed, then it doesn't have much time to gather it at all. So as you can see on the little diagram here, um, what it does is allow you to freeze different things 
in motion. So for fast shutter speeds, you can uh, use this for things such as spot, where you need to freeze an instant very quickly and you need to do it without getting any blur. Um, for medium stuff, which is just like a general use, so this is about 1 to 50th as it says here, this is the type of thing where you're not taking photos of a fast moving subject, but you are still able to hold the camera in your hands without getting any camera shake and without getting any blur. And then we go down to the really slow shutter speeds. This is when it allows us to capture like the motion of something happening. So say you are trying to take a photo of a waterfall, it blurs all the water and you get a lovely milky effect. And obviously the downside of this is that in order to still get a sharp image, you will need a tripod. Because if you try doing that by hand, then you will get a completely incoherent photo. And sometimes people want that, but getting a nice sharp photo is... Yeah, you can, if it's slightly fast, if it's slightly faster, but not too fast, you can actually pull it against, pull your camera against your neck, against your neck strap to pull it a little bit. Yeah, so there are ways you can get around it. And also, um, your camera's um, anti-shake is generally pretty good. I wouldn't rely on it solely, but it's generally quite good at its job. So, um, yeah, so shut speed as well as affecting the brightness, it affects the sharpness of your picture. So we're going to demonstrate here with the lights in the background, so I'm going to need you to stand up and go shake the background. No, I think you, do I have to throw something across shot or something? You've got to shake it. Right, shake the background. Shake the background. It's a lovely go. bokeh background that it, you can see how to set up on another one that's on YouTube. Yeah, right. So, you don't have to go far yet, but I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm changing the settings. Okay, so we're going to go drop down to ISO 200, so that's a reasonable ISO to not get too much noise. We're gonna go to an incredibly fast shutter speed and then drop down the F number so we can actually see what's happening. And obviously because it's still really dark, we'll have to bump the ISO up a little bit more. But what we have is we have 1 to 50th shutter speed. So if we go click. Oh, you've stopped now. So you can see here that it kind of um Do I need to shake more vigorously? No, it's just taking its time as it does. So if we zoom in here, you can see the lights in the background have a little bit of a blur, but not too much. So now we're gonna push it even further. So we're gonna make it even faster and increase the ISO again just so we can see what's going on properly and um, if we do a very quick snap so then what we'll be able to see on this picture when it loads it takes its time is that the lights are not quite as blurred in the background so they're blurred because the f number is very small um to get enough light in but it's not blurred because of the motion compared to uh, the previous picture. I'm gonna have to get to do it again. I need another one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, on this one you can see the slight motion as opposed to the blur. And then the last one we're gonna do is we're gonna take the shutter speed all the way down as low as we can get it. Drop the ISO down very far so it's not completely completely blown out. Same with increasing F number. And here we go again. So this is going to take for... I may have made a mistake here. You have. We're going to be standing here for... There we go. There we okay. go. That was longer than intended. But as you can see, you get loads of motion in the background. Um, because it's taking for a long time. So, shutter speed is fantastic for you to decide how much motion you want in picture. That's really cool. It does look really cool. That looks really it cool. It looks really cool, especially with it frozen in front. Yeah. Um, so yeah, shutter speed, I would advise picking your shutter speed based entirely upon the subject and what you want from it. If you're wanting to take a photo of like, dogs, which run really fast. They do, they are speedy boys. They are speedy, they zoom. Um, 
get your shutter speed really fast. If you want to insert a photo of something um, that doesn't move, um, get it down to a relatively low shutter speed and turn your ISO all the way down so you get a nice smooth image as opposed to anything blurry. And then if you want to blur scenes together like clouds or waterfalls. Yes, waterfalls look absolutely beautiful with a really long shutter speed. It goes really nimble and beautiful. And we'll have to put an example up at some point. And then great. stars, you, the longest time you can. Stars, yeah. Astrophotography is a whole other ball game. Ryan will do a session about this at, at some, some point. point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so quickly before we move on to the next bit, going back to the number of stops that um, shutter speed affects, if you half the time that the camera has to collect light, if you half the shutter speed, it will half the light let in, so you will drop it down by one stop. And if you um, double the amount of time, you double the shutter speed, it will double the amount of light let in, so you will move up one stop. So it all works by doubling and halving. So you can kind of get used to, if you change your ISO by one stop, you know you need to change your shutter speed by one stop to even it out and then back at the same exposure you started on. So. I hope you're all taking note from this. It will, be, it will be on the quiz. It was on the quiz last year, actually. Yes. So it will be on the quiz. Take notes. We're doing an exam after this. Um, so the next one and the last of like the main settings is aperture, also known as f-stop, f-number. Um, I would think of some more, but I can't think of any. So we deal with that. So f-stop. So if you want more of an in-depth explanation of f-stop, then see my previous video on the anatomy of a camera. Um, it will probably be linked in the description of this one. Yeah, it'd be useful to link in the description. It would it? be. Yeah. Um, so this one, like everything else, as well as just affecting the brightness of the image, the exposure of the image, this one affects the depth of field. This is my favourite one to use, just because it can change the photo by so much. So we'll have a look here. We'll go back to shooting. So where we are now is we'll start on a high of stop because we're already there. So we're going to take a photo here. High f stop. So what we can see here is that when it takes, what we will see after the photo is finished taken is that everything within this photo is pretty much in focus. So we zoom in. Where it was. Oh, that's the way zoom. So you can see our beautiful fog is in focus. The candle behind it that has gone out is also in focus. And the fairy lights too. Um, are also in focus. So you've got a very, very large depth of field, um, which as you can see on the diagram, is high, high ISO. High ISO, it's not ISO. High aperture, high f-stop. Um, then you get a massive depth of... Uh... I'm having a moment here. You are, you okay? I'm having, yeah. Okay. I just need to pause. By, a bit behind the scenes, it is 2am currently. Shh. <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. We're just having a time. We're just vibing. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> okay. So, massive depth of field. Everything within that field is in focus. There we go. I finally got that. So, now we're going to go the other way again. So, we're going to drop it down as low as we possibly can to f2.8. Um, as you can see, the camera is shouting at me because that is massively, massively, massively overexposed. So just to calm it down, I will move it back in. And there we go, I'll take this photo here. So what we should be able to see here after it focuses on lovely fog. <laughs> it <laughs> just took two. Yeah. Interesting. Did not expect that. It's doing things. Oh, I clicked off it before it clicked because I thought. Okay, there we go. Working out what's happening. This is a shambles, but I'm enjoying myself, so it's fine. So what we can see here is we have the cog is in focus, and yet the candle holder in the background 
is blurred and we're starting to get a lovely bokeh effect with the lights in the background. So um, your aperture, your f-stop can make a huge amount of difference on what your photo comes out looking like, particularly if you're taking photos of something such as portraiture, where you can get your subject really, really in, like, it draws your eye to the subject in the photograph. So going now to the stops um, and how this one affects it. This one is weird because there's always got to be a weird one. It's just, that's how it is. Um, this one changes not by doubling and halving your F number. So it's not like it goes from F1 to F2 or F2 to F4. This one instead goes to from F1 to F1.4 to f2 to f2.8 because it instead changes by the square root of two. Of course. Of course. There are reasons for that. Is it because circles? I don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Do not want to get into that now. Um, but yeah, this changes by the square root of two. So if you look on your camera, it generally goes, so we'll say from f1.4 to f1.6 to f1.8 to f2 so it generally goes up in a third of a stop on your camera and it's the same with shutter speeds actually um you can generally change your exposure by a third of a stop by changing just one setting um so yeah aperture it's is the weird one really cool it's the weird one but in my opinion it can have the biggest impact on the photo unless you have shut speed that means you can't get a sharp image. I think it, it's adjust the, the, for me, it's always adjust the f stop to the desired one first and then let the shutter speed around that. Yes, generally speaking, that's what I do as well. Which brings us nicely onto the next slide. Thank you for that segue. Ah, I didn't even know I was you doing it. You didn't even know you were doing it. Um, right, so. The dial's on the top. I'm going to do a horrific thing now and go like this. Oh, dear. <laughs> so the dial you get on the top here. That was dangerous. Okay. Back to the world. <laughs> um, that camera's worth a lot of money. <laughs> it is. I'm not thinking about it. It's fine. So um, generally, the main settings that are good to use and the ones that are the most important uh manual mode, average priority mode, and shutter priority mode. There is also a pre-programmed mode, which is a little bit different, but I'm not really going to speak about that in this video because it's a bit weird, essentially. So manual mode, what that does is you get to pick your ISO, you get to pick your F number, and you get to pick your shutter speed. So this one is really, really good when you have complete control over what you're taking a photo of. It's good for when you're doing like really slow shooting. So um, you have complete control of the photo you're getting. So it's really, really good as well for when the camera is getting confused essentially and can't work out what it's supposed to be doing, which I think we all relate to. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, so this one is really really good especially when like i said you are shooting in very slow um situations because what you can do is take a slightly underexposed photo a properly exposed photo and a slightly overexposed photo so when it comes to picking your photos you know you're going to have one that's within the range that you want so this is a really really good way to do it and it takes more time but you get so much control over the final photo, it's a really, really good way to do it. So shutter priority is the next one. So what you do with this is you get to pick the shutter speed, you get to set the ISO at the start, and then beyond that, the camera decides which ap aperture you should be working at. So this one is really good for when you are doing something such as sports photography, where you know you're going to have to freeze a moment and you're going to have to freeze it quickly to avoid getting any blur. So the one issue with this one is that you are more limited in aperture 
than you are in shutter speed. So you run the risk of it not being able to get a higher aperture or it not being able to get a lower aperture. So you could end up with an over or underexposed photo. And the camera is trying its best. It's not the camera's fault, but there is nothing else that it can do. Um, so in that situation, if you still need to be using uh, shutter priority, then that's when you have to go in yourself and start changing the ISO to match what you need. And the final one, aperture priority. Now, this is the one that I use the majority of the time. So I pick the F number, I decide how much depth of field I want, I decide how I want the picture to be um, composed in terms of focus, and then the camera decides the shutter speed. So this one is incredibly useful when you're out and about because you will generally end up with a photo that is exposed because you have a wide range of different shutter speeds available. So chances are you will get a photo that is exposed. Um, and yeah, you just get a lot, seemingly a lot of control over the photo that you get. Um, so with this one as well, um, you have to be careful when you are shooting the in case if you're shooting in low light, the shutter speed may slow down enough that you start getting camera shake. So you need to kind of take note of um, whereabouts your shutter speed is going to be just in case you end up with a really short sl short shutter speed. A really slow <laughs> shutter speed. <laughs> <laughs> you end up with a really slow shutter speed. And you end up with a really blurry picture because at the end of the day, getting a sharp picture is obviously one of the main things you want from a photo, is that the photo itself is actually in focus. So, um, yeah, hopefully this was useful as just like a really quick run through of how the different settings on a camera work together to make your photo. Hopefully it can be like a quick reference guide almost. Yeah, quick reference. The uh, Can I ask Mr Tech Wizard to flip back to the first exposure, exposure slide? Yeah. With the, with the, with the triangle. With, with the triangle. That's just going to be yes. the... That's going to be the... Um... Triangle. Go back. Because now that we've been through it all, I want to look at the triangle again because it literally tells you everything. This is just going to be the thumbnail for the video and yeah, you won't even need honestly, to do the video. If you need to know, this is what you need to look at. So it can tell you whether high or low ISO aperture and shutter speed will bring in more or less light and it will also tell you the effect it will have on your photo. Such as changing the sharpness, changing the depth of field or changing the amount of grain. This triangle is beautiful and I love it more than anything in this world and on that note I should probably end this session and go to bed. Probably both should, yeah. shouldn't we? Thanks guys! Thank you. That was fun. Thank you for coming and watching. And hopefully this is nice and... Hopefully it'll be fine. Yeah. Be right. Yeah. It'll be, be alright. Yeah. Later. See ya.